Hey everybody, Tommy Von Voigt here, and I'm gonna be doing a series of videos all about my guitars from my collection. I have a bunch of really cool guitars from the 80s, and each one of them has been a project, well, to different degrees, some of them much more so than others. And I'm gonna start all of these with this one right here, this monster, 1989 BC Rich Gunslinger. This one, from start to finish, has been one hell of a journey. You want to talk about a transformation it's incredible and i can't wait to share all the details with you now speaking of details this is going to get pretty techy and uh, pretty geeky so if you're not into that kind of thing you might want to check out now i totally understand but if you dig vintage guitars you dig vintage bc riches uh, if you're just really into the process of how these things get fixed up or if you just want to hear all about somebody spending way too much money on something you're going to enjoy this video so let's get started now, I said this is a 1989 BC Rich Gunslinger. If you're really into vintage BC Riches, you might notice some things. You might be saying, wait a second, look at those controls, look at the uh, pickups. This has got to be an ST3. It's not an ST3. This is actually a Gunslinger, as you can see from the angle cut on the neck heel. So what's the story on this then? The story on this is this was custom ordered in 1989. And we've got some planes going overhead. We're gonna be enjoying the nice, beautiful weather in this late spring day on a New York City rooftop, so don't mind the noise. But this was custom ordered in maybe very, very late 88, early 89. We'll circle back around to that shortly from the custom shop. And it was a gunslinger that was ordered with these pickups, with these uh, the ST3 controls. And it was ordered with, what you're seeing here is a Dan Lawrence paint job with the quote unquote bullet holes that go right through the body to the other side. And no, they did not actually take that out back behind the shop and, and shoot through them. Uh, you know, contrary to urban legend, they're just drilled right through and made to look like bullet holes. And this was custom ordered also with a flat mount Kaler. So if you know anything about the gunslingers, you know that they all tend to come with Floyd type bridges and you know, the single angled bridge humbucker and if it's an assassin it'll also have a neck pickup and very very minimal controls but this one was a custom order now you're going to be hearing me talk a lot of trash about what was done to this thing before i got possession of it and i want to be very 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 clear about something the original owner did not destroy this guitar the guy i bought the guitar from absolutely did not destroy the guitar since it left the possession of the original owner and prior to the guy that I bought it from getting it, this thing was vandalized beyond comprehension. Like I can't even believe it, it still even was even able to be rebuilt. Speaking of the guy I bought it from, I bought this last year and I'm gonna be looking at my notes over here so don't mind me looking off to the side. I bought this actually from eBay. It was an eBay listing from a gentleman named Evil Mike Greco on July 8th, 2022. Apparently this thing had been listed on eBay for a while. Some of you guys out there actually might recognize this. I know that there were people who looked at it and contemplated buying it and fixing it up themselves. And the amount of work it needed uh, discouraged a lot of people. And I totally understand that. I purchased it from Evil Mike and it, it, there was just something about it that spoke to me. The fact that it was an actual real Dan Lawrence paint job and just something cool about it. The fact that he, he did a very limited number of these, I, think, I guess this is called winter camo these fighter plane graphics. They're all completely unique. None of them are the same. I don't really know how many were ever made. I've heard very, very low numbers. I'm not gonna bother quoting here because I don't know if they're accurate at all, but suffice it to say that this is most likely a completely unique guitar. And however many others are similar, I can't really say the number. But I, I decided to roll the dice on it and, and give it a full restoration and see how much of the original Dan Lawrence artwork we could preserve. Now, once I got my hands on it, I realized I was uh, I was really kind of almost in over my head in some ways. So let's start up here at the headstock. Now I'm going to try superimposing some of the pictures from before so you can see the results. Now the graphic on the headstock obviously matches the body and it was there but it was so faded it was like it had sat on the, uh, the back, under the back window of a car for like 40 years and just was completely sun bleached out. You could just barely make it out. But it was enough so that we could actually do a tracing of it 
and figure out what colors went where so we can restore that. The tip was actually just kind of like snapped off of the art. It was just like, like a chunk out of the wood that was missing. And there was also something really goofy with the Made in USA part of the decal where it was factory applied, but it was factory applied all screwy. And as you could see, I opted to actually do it correctly and not recreate BC Rich's mistake. Now, an interesting thing about this is I was originally confused, and this is totally on me, with the nut configuration. I was like, it looks like it's 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 uh, it looks like it's it's set up for a Floyd nut, like the shelf was was routed in, but it was too wide for a Floyd nut. And once you were to bolt the truss rod cover on, there would have been too much space. Well, eventually I figured out, duh, Tommy, that since it was ordered with a Kaler, for reasons I can't really understand, when BC Rich built this for the customer, they built it with a standard nut and then put the Kaler string lock after the standard nut and then put the truss rod cover, which is odd to me because at this point in time, they were doing so many gunslingers with Floyds and Floyd nuts that you would think that they would have just done a typical Floyd nut and not even bothered with the standard nut, but I guess, Maybe, I don't know, because it was ordered with a Kaler, they figured they had to do the whole package. So they did a standard nut and the Kaler string lock and then the truss rod cover. So figure that all out. We've got brand new Schaller M6s locker, locking uh, M6 tuners. The original, so I don't know what's going on here. I, I don't know if at some point somebody had put different tuners on here or if the tuners that came on here had the lock screw there, but there were also two lock screw holes there. So I went with this style. You can still see those. It's just battle scars. Some things I just had to let kind of like slide. So moving on to the neck, the neck was a mess. The frets were shot. The board was extremely flat. When we first checked it out, it seemed as though it was re-radiused at some point to 20 degrees which is crazy, but obviously they were looking to make this an absolute shred machine. I don't believe that was stock because as you can see, the markers are right on the edge, which means this thing was re-radiused at some point in the past. I don't know when. Not only did they re-radiused it to 20 degrees, but they re-radiused it apparently by hand. So it was actually uneven and it wasn't even side to side. So the treble side of the fretboard was actually higher than the base side of the fretboard. They went way too far on the side that you're gonna most notice it on. So that was a problem and we had no meat to like work with. So we had to re-radius the board leaning heavily on the treble side to try to even that out and also bring the radius down to, we got it around 12 to 14 degrees, I think. So it, it kind of feels more like my Gibson's. So moving on down to the body. Now, oh, actually before I move on, the back of the neck was covered in clear coat, but they hadn't, it, it was almost as though the thing had gotten years of grime and then they clear coated over the grime. So they trapped the dirt and, and finger oil into the neck and it just cleared right over the damn thing. So we've sanded this whole thing down and it's just treated with oil and beeswax. So it's it gives a, a nice, beautiful raw finish. There's no clear on this neck at all, completely raw maple neck, and it feels fantastic. Super thin and super, super fast. So moving on, the body. Now the front, yes, the front still had this original Dan Lawrence paint job. The back, as gorgeous as this looks, if you look at the before photo, whoever had this in the intervening years between the original owner and Mike Greco, completely stripped the Dan Lawrence paint job off the back, gouged the hell out of it, put some weird goofy graphic of the comic book character Spawn, lost the control cavity cover. I mean, it was just an absolute nightmare. Now, when I first picked this up and I was reaching out to some people who were really knowledgeable on these things, I was asking them questions like, what should I do? What would the backup look like? I got a lot of very well-meaning um, suggestions to just go ahead and just sand the back, paint it black like it would have been from the factory, just put it together and play it. Obviously, I couldn't have just put it together and played it because the neck was a nightmare. And I wasn't convinced that the back had been black. I was like, I don't know, because on the ones that I've seen where there's a graphic on the front and nothing on the back, the artwork stops at the body line here. And on the side, you wouldn't have anything. And then you would have a black back or whatever. This 
had what was remaining of the front artwork still wrapping around all the way around, all the way around on the bottom. It was all still there. So I was like, I don't know. I'm suspicious of this. So then I started doing like detective work. I was looking online and I tried to figure out, okay, can I find any photos of any of the other ones that were done similar to this in this winter camo gunslinger thing? I only found a couple. One was in the music video Weapons of Our Warfare by this Christian metal band called Deliverance. And the lead guitarist, I think George Ochoa, I believe his name is, he's playing one. And he's got different numbers here, but the graphic is the same. You can't really see the back and the, the quality of the resolution is really, really low. So like, let me see if I can find this dude on Facebook or anywhere. So I actually found the dude on Facebook, sent him a message. And then when I was looking on his social media, Turns out that he spends a lot of his free time sharing homophobic memes. So I was like, well, fuck this guy. Too bad because it turns out he does still have his, but at that point I just didn't want to know anything about him or anything he had to say. Then I found out that Josh from the band Toxic had one of these. My buddy Ronnie Iglesias is the singer from Toxic. I was like, Ronnie, hit up Josh. See if he's still got his gunslinger with the winter camo. I want to find out what the back of his looked like so I can confirm what the hell to do. Never heard back. I can only assume that means Josh does not still have his gunslinger with the winter camo paint, camo paint job, and maybe it's a bit of a sore subject. But right around that same time, I got contacted after posting pictures of this online by the original owner. And I have all of his information here. His name is John Hoffensberger, and I am certain I'm, mis I'm mispronouncing his name. I'm pretty sure he's from Minnesota. And I am definitely getting that name wrong. So, John, I'm so sorry. But he reached out to me and he confirmed that he was the original owner. He, he custom ordered it exactly as its outfit. And he was playing in the band Brass Kitten at the time. They toured all around the U.S. They did make some recordings. I, I managed to find some of the recordings on YouTube. And they actually pretty much rip. They're, they're pretty kick-ass. And I believe, I didn't actually keep breaking his chops to confirm, but I'm pretty sure the recordings I heard were done with this beast right here. And he was super helpful. He dug through his archives and he found all the photos of him on stage with this back in 89, 90 that he could, sent them to me. And I'll throw some of those up on screen. They're freaking awesome. And unfortunately, there was no clear shot of the back, but you could see just enough of the back that it confirmed the Dan Lawrence paint job wrapped fully around the guitar. So, that meant to do this right, I had to recreate the camo art on the back. Enter Vince Michael at Vince Michael Guitars. He's been in the business since way back in the day, since the 80s. You might know him better as the guy who owns basically every spare part for vintage Kramer that there is. And he is a really talented luthier and refinisher. And he's the one that fixed up the neck. And he is the one that recreated Dan Lawrence's art on the back of the guitar. So everywhere it stopped, he just recreated it, recreated the camo pattern, had to match the colors from the front to do the back, and left, as you could see, all of the damage that existed in this paint job all the way around, left it on there, and recreated additional damage on the back to kind of tie the whole thing together. Then, after carefully cleaning the paint and getting all the yellowing and the grease and the grime off of there, did the whole thing in numerous heavy coats of clear, blocked the whole thing down, buffed it out, so that the whole thing is now preserved under fresh clear. And in the case of like the, the existing damage that we left, it has this wild effect of almost looking like he airbrushed that on there. But what you're seeing trapped under the clear is everything that was remaining on the front of this guitar, including the damage. And it's pretty awesome, this approach that we took. And I'm really, really proud of the way this thing came out. Now, along the way, I also found in the neck pocket, it looked like a name of the music store that the guitar was ordered through, and also the initials RE. In posting the photos on the Facebook groups for BC Rich fans, Ron Estrada, who worked at the BC Rich shop, reached out and said, he confirmed that he actually built this thing. And in Ron's name, in Ron's words are, my initials are in the neck pocket. I made it at the South El Monte shop. It was most likely a stock run. It became a custom piece when the paint department got it. Dan Lawrence would know more about it. 
I did also reach out to Dan Lawrence. It was confirmed that this was his work, but he did not know anything more about it because the dude has painted so many guitars. You can't expect him to remember any details. And fortunately, the original owner, John, reached out and filled in all the gaps. And I, I'm, just, I'm just stunned by the way it came out. So now we're looking at the body. So what do we got? We got all new parts everywhere. The only things I was able to preserve besides the body and the neck and the original neck plate were three of the neck plate screws. Not even all four of them, only three of them. And normally I would not even bother keeping any kind of hardware like that, but because so much of this guitar was lost, I was like, how much can we possibly preserve? So body, neck, neck plate, and three of the neck screws. And the neck plate, I initially I wanted to get cute, and I, was, I sent this out to get powder coated by one of my connections in the freestyle BMX restoration industry. And it turns out that was the wrong idea because when this got back powder coated, it was just all the details were gone. You couldn't make out the serial number. So I was like, no, I'm sending it back to you. Strip the powder off, strip everything off, get this thing down to as, as close to raw bare metal as possible. And that's how I'll rock it. And it just has this nice weathered look like a vintage warplane does. The original control cavity cover, as you know, was long lost and nobody makes one of these for a gunslinger or an ST3 or an assassin. So Vince Michael made this using his CNC machine. We traced the, the actual opening of the cavity and since it's a US model, it doesn't get countersunk, it sits on top. The uh, countersunk ones are how you know it was made overseas. So I made the shape in Illustrator, sent it to him, he ran it off in the CNC machine on pickguard material, cut it out real nice, nice, countersunk the screw holes, it's fantastic. I managed to scare up a metal output jack plate, which matched with the metal truss rod cover that I had. On the front, these knobs actually came on my 87 bitch. It had been cover, custom ordered with a bunch of black hardware and I switched it to different type of knobs and I kept these and they found a perfect home on here. I thought they worked great with the theme. Brand new Kaler and the, the benefit of the new Kaler, it has the set screws so you can lock it out if you don't want to have the, uh, the trim available to you. This pickup right here, I ordered from the Seymour Duncan Custom Shop. This is the Warren Demartini RTM, which I believe stands for Radis Tonus Maximus. It's something like 19K A2 mag. It's an insanely hot A2 magnet pickup. And it was made by MJ herself in the custom shop. She signed the bottom of it and Warren Demartini signed the bottom of it. This pickup kills. It's got this singing sweet thing going on, but it's also got excellent clear articulation. It's just a fantastic pickup. I can't say enough good things about it. Apparently I'm not the only one that agrees because I went back to check on whether or not it was still available and they've moved it to a regular production item. So now you don't have to get it from the custom shop. You don't have to wait. You can just go right on the Duncan website and just buy one of those and it's a fantastic pickup. The middle and the neck pickup. So as best I could tell from the pictures I got from John, the middle and the neck pickups that came in here, which were also long gone, everything was long gone, were possibly rails pickups. We don't really know, but they appear to have solid black covers on them. So I hit up my dude at MJS up in Canada, and I had him wind these for me. These are prototypes. They are not actually commercially available, but they are a Rails pickup with ceramic magnets in it that he custom voiced and matched in output knowing what my bridge pickup was going to be. Now the controls. As we've said before, these are ST3 controls on a gunslinger body. Normally you would just have one angled humbucker and you'd have one knob there, but the ST3 has three toggles. So you have a master volume, master tone, and three toggles. Now, as best I, I'm, I'm aware, as, as far as I'm aware, the original ST3 control configuration was you can basically turn the bridge on and off, middle on and off, or neck on and off, and you can have any combination of them. So that basically gives you the ability to have seven position strat. But I wanted something a little bit fancier than that. So this is neck on and off. This is middle on and off. Down is just bridge on. Of course, that's where I've got it set because why would I use anything else? If you go up, it coil splits the bridge and turns on that and that, giving you strap position two, but true strap position two of single coil, single coil. And then up is, you know, you can turn it off, which means 
you can actually do strap position two and four and humbucker and humbucker on. So that would be, instead of seven position, would that be nine position? I should have done the math beforehand, but it's actually more than even a seven position like modified strat switch. This is just crazy. And it's pretty cool. Just typical strap locks, but I'm gonna be replacing those with DiMarzio clip locks. And that's pretty much the long and the short of it. So, uh, oh yes, uh, stainless steel jumbo frets. I'm trying to remember everything that I've done just so everyone gets a full picture of this thing. And it just, it just came out absolutely awesome. It's absolutely stunning. It plays fantastic. The angle cut in the neck heel is perfect for me because I'm a big baby about upper, upper fret access. All of my other guitars are either set neck Gibsons or Ibanez, like my 87 Destroyer, or all my neck through VC Riches, which obviously have ridiculous upper fret access. But this thing, I gotta say, it's pretty decent for a bolt-on as far as being able to get up there. So now, do I have any complaints? I'm gonna be ending every, every one of these videos saying, do I have any complaints? Do I have any reservations or, or uh, regrets about it? Anything like that? I can't really say that I do. As far as playability goes, it plays fantastic. The only thing that's a bit of a stumbler for me is I'm so used to 24 and 3 quarter neck scale that going to a 25 and a half neck scale is a little bit tricky for me, but I'm getting the hang of it. You know, I, I got lots of friends who are far better guitarists than I who can go back and forth, but it doesn't even matter. But it plays so nice, it's like, okay, get used to it, Tommy. The only other thing I would say I would, I'm not really thrilled about, and this is not so much really the fault of this guitar, it's really the fault of Kaler. Anybody out there who's got a Kaler, I think they feel fantastic. I just love how smooth they are. I actually, I think I might even prefer them over a Floyd. But the, the trim arm for a Kaler sticks up like an inch, inch and a half, inch and a quarter. And I just hit it constantly when I'm playing anything. And if it was just low profile, like if the thread started right at the bend, so it could hang out of your way like a Floyd arm or an Ibanez edge arm, I would love it. So what I'm probably gonna do is I'm probably gonna either modify one of my existing arms or have one bent and, and, and threaded. But other than that, this thing just absolutely rocks. And I'm, I'm so glad I went the extra distance on this, went the extra mile on it, and it just came out awesome. You know, I, I really, honestly, this thing, this thing was almost a lost cause. Before, before I got it, Mike Greco apparently was using it as wall art. He just had uh, just some random junk Kaler on there. The neck was just temporarily bolted on. It was strung up just so it looked like a, a complete guitar, but it wasn't playable. I think he had it up for like a half a dozen or a dozen years. God only knows what kind of life it had before then. I mean, it was basically, it was, it was given up for dead. And I think a lot of more sensible people might have just done exactly that. But I was like, no, let's see. Let's see if I can rescue this thing. And it came out so badass and I'm so proud of it. So I'm so glad to show it off to all of you out there. I hope you dig it. Leave any comments, uh, questions in the, uh, in the comment section. Any, anything, anything I might've missed, anything uh, that you wanna ask me about, anything I didn't go into enough detail on. If you hate what I did, if you hate the fact that I, that I recreated the Dan Lawrence art on the back, if, if you're definitely team, you should have just put it together as is and not done anything. Leave a comment, you know, I'll probably ignore it. I'm the one that spent the money, not you, but go ahead, uh, you know, share your opinion anyway. And rock and roll. <laughs>